If you're trading just purely technical, you're being tone deaf to what is happening with your baby. I, your asset class is your baby. Obviously, central banks are moving the markets. These guys are in control of, of money supply. We've seen times when there have been corrupt central bankers. For example, there was a guy called SNB's Hildebrand, and he was a former chairman of the SNB. Before his decisions, and he has found out to this with his wife and, and some other of his family members, before he used to announce a decision or when they were going to change monetary policy, he used to be tell his wife, look, on, on your trading account, uh, buy Swiss franc because I'm going to say this today. In this episode of The Weight of the CPT, we have Ken Chigbu, a trader with over 15 years experience in the financial market. He started as a T-boy at 16 years old and worked his way up to becoming one of the youngest fundamental analysts in London at a leading boutique analysis firm. He worked as a Forex dealer helping large corporations manage over 50 million in foreign exchange exposure. He's been trading full time since 2016, managing seven figures in private capital. Ken shares how fundamentals can increase your edge in forex equity indices and commodities markets without further ado let's talk to ken before we get started with the podcast i'd like to talk to you about funded next funded next is a disruptor in the prop industry with two unique offerings number one they're the only prop firm in the industry that pays traders 15 percent of their challenge profits traders generally don't like trading during the challenge phase because they don't actually earn any money Funded Next has addressed traders' concerns by allowing them to earn money during the challenge. On average, traders earn two to three times the challenge fee when they successfully pass and get their first payout. For example, the cost of a 50K account is around 2.99 and the 15% profit split from passing the challenge is 9.75. It's a one to three ROI, not including the profits earned from the simulated funded account. Number two, they promise that traders will receive receive payouts within 24 hours from the request or they will give them $1,000. This is a bold guarantee and sets them apart from many firms. Funded Next is one of the few prop firms that provides balance-based drawdown and they emphasize that their trading conditions are amongst the best due to them owning dedicated servers for MT4 and MT5. They pride themselves on providing raw spreads and the lowest commissions in the prop firm industry. They also are expected to release an integration with TradingView in December in which traders will be able to execute trades and do their charting directly from the Funded Next dashboard. If you want to take a challenge with a company that is disrupting the industry and creating opportunity globally, diversify or scale your prop firm accounts to new levels, get access to your account within seconds and 10% off by clicking the link in the description. Welcome to another podcast episode of The Way of the CPT, The Consistently Profitable Trader. We have with us Ken Chigbo. I came all the way from Texas. I'm here in the UK with some of my trader brothers, and he gladly accepted my invitation. There's a guy named Tim Grover. Um, he trained Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, some of the greatest NBA players to ever live. And there's certain special insights that you get from a guy like that. So he was in an interview, and someone asked him, what's the difference between Michael Jordan and Kobe? And he said that Kobe worked harder but Michael worked smarter. Mm -hmm. You could only get that type of insight from someone that had worked with both of those individuals. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know Ken, he worked inside of an institution. And I think there's certain insights when it comes to fundamentals that we could only get from someone that served as a fundamental analyst at sort of like the highest level, at one of the highest levels. So what I want to give to the audience today is sort of like a little masterclass on fundamentals, right? So thanks for joining the podcast. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that, Abdullah. Thank you very much, brother. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get started with childhood upbringing, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about where you're from? Yeah, so I've, uh, I'm always, I'm born and raised in London. Um, so my, I was telling you earlier, my mom and my dad are both sort of migrated from their respective countries. My dad from Nigeria, a very well-educated and typical strict African family that wants their, you know, their whole child line to be, uh, you know, very well educated. My mum, she left Italy at such a young age when she was 12, came to England with her mother. And, you know, they both started from sort of nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when they had me, we literally had nothing. They were hard workers, hard grafters, juggling multiple jobs, trying to provide, you know, a good pathway for me. And, you know, throughout my childhood, we always lived in, you know, rough areas, council yeah. estates, um, but that didn't stop these these guys' work ethics, you know, to, to wanted to provide the best for me. So 
you know, as a normal kid, went to school. I wasn't very academic through my school years. I struggled because I don't know whether I have this sort of undiagnosed ADHD or whatever it may be, but my sometimes I, I my tension levels just go off the radar. So I'm, I may be there physically in my body, but in my head, I'm just elsewhere. Um, I used to distract other children, just being a class clown, basically. But I was smart. So when I locked in, I had, you know, laser vision, my channel focus, um, but it was just difficult to lock into those zones. I, I found it hard to get in there. You know, I was very distracted. So when I got to, I don't know how you call it in America, but when I got to secondary school, I was given an opportunity when I turned 16 to start working as a runner. So essentially my mum was an accountant within, on a trade floor in London. So what I would do is essentially I was like a tea boy for, um, for traders. I'd get in their breakfasts, their lunches, dinners, dry cleaning, everything. But the beautiful thing was I was exposed to, to that industry, to that, to that market, which I, I hadn't really known about before. I, I yeah. wasn't aware at 16 years old, I wasn't really aware about financial markets as such, but I got a good taste for it. Just seeing all, you know, these prices flicker on his screen, these traders showing all these motions at their desk. Um, I, and it sort of bit me in a way. I was, I was like, okay, I like, I like the look of this. Um, so I started, you know, speaking to a lot of the guys on the floor, started to dive in to, um, you know, do my own little bit of research. So fortunately enough, um, again, this is one of those things, I, I know it's a bit of a handout. It was a bit of a handout, but if I wasn't tenacious um, during my time, you know, when I was a 16 year old doing those, uh, that trader role, uh, the T-boy role, I wouldn't have got this opportunity. So uh, my mom spoke to a few people again, it's like, look, this is his situation. Uh, is there anything we could potentially do for him? Um, and because I was hungry, because they saw I, you know, my determination, I was tenacious, they was like, okay, we'll let him have this role again. So I went back in there, you know, so I didn't go to university. I went back into this role. I was, I was switched on, um, you know, just showing a lot of interest, asking a lot of questions where I could, you know, in between getting all the people food. And, um, and then um, I, I got the attention of a couple of people. I got attention of a group of traders, and, but I also got some attention from some analysts. So there were analysts, a uh, private group of analysts that run this boutique firm, which at the time was called Rand Squawk. So they were essentially over a Squawk service. They'd provide um, anything, that, any breaking news, any general market commentary analysis. Essentially, traders don't always have the time to digest the news, you know. Absolutely. So these guys are sat at their screens, they need to make money. They want to hear the news as quick and digestible as possible. That's what that company was doing. They were like, look, we like you. Um, do you want to come in for a two-week trial? Of course, I'm taking that by both hands. And I almost messed it up at the beginning because um, they gave me a like a test. They wanted me to learn about central banks. That was the first thing. Learn about all the members. I had to revise all the members of the, the, the Bank of England, the FOMC, and ended up cheating on that test. And they caught me. And they called me into a room. They're like, man, why, why did you do that? They were so close to letting me go. And they dropped the line of, you know, if we didn't know your mum, you'd be gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> when okay. you get that line, it's yeah. like, hey, yeah. it's, it's serious. Yeah, it's serious. So I got my act together and we're just... You know, every day I was in from before six, five to six. So ahead of the European Open in the morning. And then I'd be leaving at 6 p.m. Was know? that 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 was the culture of long hours with the culture? That was the Especially culture, if you bro. were like just starting. Yeah, man. If you if you're leaving at like 4.30, 5 o'clock, you, you get the comment of half day, is it? <laughs> 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 Bear in mind, you've been there 11 hours, you know. And so that was the culture. It was yeah. just it, long hours. Long grind, yeah, long hours. Yeah. Digest, get that exposure. And it taught me a lot. I... You know, sometimes I struggled mentally dealing with it because I've just come from obviously being a school kid, still school, fairly immature in a way, um, to going into working long hours. It was a big shift for me. Yeah. Um, while my friends were going off to university, still enjoying life, you know, student life. But I was there. You know? So at that time, you were bitten by the bug. But what kept you motivated, like, to keep going those long hours? Like, what were your targets at the time? Did you have any or were you just like, you know what? My parents or my father, he, he sees me as a failure. So I, I, I want to prove him wrong. You hit the nail on the head there, bro. It was my dad. That was my motivation. It's like, I need to prove this guy wrong. You know, he's called me a failure. He made me, honestly, he made me feel like, I love my dad. You know, even if it wasn't for my dad, I wouldn't be where I am today. But he really made me feel insignificant during that period. Um, so that was what, that was kept driving me. Those long hours, those tears of, you know, struggling with anxiety because, you know, I was just, so over consumed by the long hours. I was drinking a lot of coffee and that used to trigger anxiety and panic attacks. But anyway, I got through all of that. And in terms of like my targets, I'll be honest with you, then I was still, I wasn't thinking the way I think today in terms of clarity, in terms of my targets, my goals. I was just 
then it was just about hard, hard work, not necessarily smart work and clear direction, but just grinding out as much as I could, building my knowledge. I saw that as my university. And mm -hmm. that's why I always say to people with fundamentals now, just see it as further, this is further education. It's gonna really serve you well. Um, so study it, study it like it's your baby and get to know it. Um, and that's exactly what I did. That's what drove me forward. You know, mm. I saw it as my uni you yeah. know, to learn that information. So from there, how did you start actually taking trades yourself? I have some questions about the insides of that, but yeah, I want to, I'll come back to the, you know, the things, uh, information about the central banks and uh, investment banks and things like that. Yeah. But how did you, how did you start trading from there? So personally, obviously having learned fundamentals, um, I got to understand how, why, you know, GP moving, why Euro is moving, every little bit of news that was coming out, even when it came out, there are times when um, there wouldn't be that initial reaction straight away, but because I know how the markets react, I would get in. So I was um, basically watching a few traders, you know, during my time on the floor uh, when I was uh, getting teas and stuff. I, was, I, I used that time to watch a couple of the traders and they would react to certain news. So say for example, oh, we just see a central banker, he just said da -da 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 -da, on interest rates, interest rates are gonna go up next month for the decision, blah, blah, something along those lines. Then he would take a position and buy. There would be that, that little interval before the market really reacts, before it gets out to everybody where you could get in and trade. Mm. So that, I learned that from those guys trading the news there. So when I was, um, you know, obviously not at the, initially there was, there was two roles, right? You're either at the squawk here on the microphone, feeding the information out, or you're the one finding all the news, watching all the screens and putting the information up. So when I was not on the squawk and I was uh, on the desk next to it, um, digesting everything, I would trade. So anytime I see a bit of news, ever, whether it's, uh, you know, unplanned news or planned news, I would trade it. So uh, depending on how it came out, yeah. I, I would look to trade. Now that, things have changed a lot since then. We had the opportunity to do that. Now, it, there's a lot more, you know, there's machines in the market, there's technology where, you know, when this, you know, data comes out- you, Within a millisecond, yeah, within you a see millisecond. a spike. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But we had those opportunities before. That's how my first trading started off. Uh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. So what you're saying is basically, before algorithms like are, became more popular, maybe it was manual, a manual trade, right? So information would come out, they would analyze the data quickly, and then they would manually place the trade. But now when we see those instant spikes, it's just algos picking up um, the data release. Maybe they have like some sort of machine learning, they're scanning the data release for certain variables, and then automatically the algo buys or sells. Exactly. Now, just on that point, yes, we weren't comp competing machines. We were just competing against each other, humans. It was how fast can you click that button? How fast can you quickly input your, your trade size and then execute buy or sell? That is what we are competing with. And the amount of times, it doesn't happen so often now, but the amount of times I would have seen, you know, on the charts, um, you get these real aggressive spikes to the upside and then they quickly come down. The reason for that is because everyone's moving quickly and errors happen. And what we saw a lot of the time was what's known as the, the terminology of fat finger. And mm. that's essentially someone placing one too many zeros or, you know, they entered the wrong digit and they bought too many or sold too many of a specific currency or, or, or instrument. And the price just quickly reverses back down. And it's like, OK, um, you know, we're hearing talk that, that was a fat finger by X institution. So it ha that that's happened. interesting, man. Yeah, yeah. I never heard of that. Yeah, man. Wow. Fat finger, yeah, so. OK, so I have a question here. Can you break down maybe the hierarchy mm. like their central banks, investment banks, Who's moving the market? Like when these spikes are happening, who's actually moving the market? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for me, obviously central banks are moving uh, the markets. These guys are in control of, of money supply. These guys are the ones that are setting the policy. And <clears throat> just quickly before I break things down, further, the reason I say central banks are in control, we've seen um, times when there have been, um, you know, corrupt, corrupt central bankers. For example, and people could go and research this, there was a guy called SNB's Hildebrand, and he was uh, a former chairman of the SNB. Mm. Now, he, before his decisions, and he has found out to this with his wife and, and some other family members, before he used to announce a decision or when they were going to change monetary policy, he used to be tell his wife, look, on your, on my, on, on your trading account, uh, buy Swiss franc because I'm going to say this today. That's a sort of manipulation. So these guys are right at the top. Obviously that guy got caught out and obviously paid fines. I don't know if he went to prison, he probably avoided it. But anyway, that's the sort of things that we're dealing with. These guys are at the top. So the central banks are number one. Right, so we're looking at, when we, when we see Powell, mm -hmm. Fed, he's like the CEO. Yeah. And <laughs> whatever he says, investors are gonna pick it up. Exactly. So when they change the monetary policy, he knows about it, mm -hmm. right? 
he has the ability to kind of mandate where price will go, right? The flow of money. Okay. All right. Sure. So that's it for the BOE, BOJ, ECB, or EBC, right? Yeah. Everybody has their sort of CEO. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Like this guy. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And they're at the top. They're at the top. They're at the top. Now, let me say just something because you, you just said, and it's true, uh, the central bank does essentially dictate where, you know, the price action. He does, They do. They, they want the market to go a particular way. But there are times when <clears throat> we will have the market, i.e. now this is the next level down, we'll have big financial institutional players. And these big players all have a bias. They all have... Um, a book of where they want the, um, you know, where they want uh, a particular asset to go. Yeah. They'll have that bias. Now, there are times when the market, i.e. these big institutions underneath the central banks, obviously these guys don't have as much power, but these guys have big volumes as well. Yeah. Now, they will bully the central bank into a direction they want the market to go. So in the sense, what I mean is, that like what we're seeing at the moment, there's a theme right now of dollar. We've been seeing a dollar downside within recent times we, because markets are aggressively pricing in rate cuts to come. They want rate cuts. Why do these institutions, why do these businesses press in the FOMC for rate cuts? Because they want a low, lower cost environment. The high interest rate environment is eating into business profits. It's eating into their profit margins. So right. they're bullying the FOMC. It's like cut rates, cut rates, cut rates. We're pressing with flow this way. So then it's the FMC's job again to try and regain control and be like, look, we're pushing back on these expectations. This is where policy's going. Um, and they'll try and sort of, you know, kick the market back into, into gear, into check, essentially. Man, that's interesting, man. Yeah. This, this is a, as I mentioned it from the start, this is going to be a masterclass. So <laughs> the traders, if you're out there, you want to share this and, and rewatch this over and over. Okay. So now central bank. And then you have the this big large financial institutions. Mm -hmm. What are their interests? Is it mostly just speculative? The interest underneath, like the central bank. I know the central bank, their interest is the economy to control the flow of money. So they raise interest rates, lower interest rates, right? They want to keep stability. Mm -hmm. Now the large institutions underneath, what's their interest mainly? Well, yeah, it's mainly speculative. Mainly speculative. You know, so they obviously want to produce returns for their books. They have you know, with institutions, they have big in investors on board, right? Whether it's uh, a corporation investing um, into an in a financial institution, obviously then the, the purpose of that investment is to diversify, you know, or we ha may have, for example, M&A action, right? So a financial institution may want the market to go a certain way because they know a big M&A deal is happening, you know, and- What's the M&A deal? Just to make it accessible so, for- Yeah, of course. So M&A is merger and acquisition. So when we get a big company ready to buy out another company, a smaller company, so what would happen is we'll get, a, when M&A is occurring, especially with international companies, say for example, we've got a US company ready to buy out a UK company. Um, they, to buy out this UK company, they're gonna need, you know, when we, at times when we need different currencies, we have to sell. So say for example, this US company, in order to buy this UK company, they need to sell their dollars into pounds. So what we're going to have, if this is a multi-billion dollar deal, these are times when, say for example, it's a, a $5 billion deal. These are times when it's going to uh, affect market, you know, the way in which the market moves. If we've got a big order going through at certain periods of the, of the day of the time, yeah. or whenever. Yeah. Um, but then also these, these small fluctuations in interest rates have an impact on the business profit margins. So mm -hmm. they want, they'll want at a time, for example, they want a dollar to be stronger than the pound so that it costs them less to acquire this business. So there's there's a whole load of things that would take, we could go into yeah. a lot of detail, but there's a whole host of reasons why, you know, these institutions will want the market in certain ways. People have to remember there is a lot of um, real money flows. When we're talking about real money, we're not talking about the central, uh, the, these financial institutions just speculating on price action. These guys are conducting, as I just explained, mergers and acquisitions. These guys have big portfolios where they're investing, for example, in emerging markets, they're investing in Brazil, they're investing in India or in, in the Eurozone, wherever the case may be. And then when they're investing in, in these multiple avenues, whether it's through via, you know, they're investing in commodities or they're investing in, in stocks, they're going to have these portfolios and these portfolios are made up of different currencies. So they may have GBP, dollars, euros, Brazilian real. And there are times that the, the, the ultimate goal of a financial institution as well is they want to keep their books balanced. These portfolios want their uh, managers want their books balanced. So there may be times when they have a surplus of Brazilian real or they have a surplus of Indian rupee and then they need to balance their books. So what they'll do, they'll repatriate or, you know, sell some of those funds and then buy out, uh, you know, where there's a shortfall. Uh, say, for example, there's a shortfall in Brazilian real. They sell Indian rupee. So Indian rupee weakness. Brazilian real strengthens because this institution is buying some more real to balance their books. So those are the real money flows that I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, these guys at the end of the day, they're financial institutions. Yes, they're involved in OTC. Yes, but they are portfolio managers. All right. So now central bank, investment bank, and then 
what's under that? What would be, if if, if anything, like you, I think you probably have like smaller private investors. Yeah, it'd be smaller private investors, um, you know, little boutique investment companies. And then okay. more or less, it'll be us, you and know, us, yeah. it'll be us, um, big players and then retail guys. All right. So now knowing all of this information, you as an analyst, yeah. how then do you start to trade? How do you load up your accounts and how you, how do you start to develop your, your playbook? So there's four pillars that I, I use. Mm -hmm. Playbook, which is your different setups and strategies, mm -hmm. right? Risk management, psychology, like the, the mindset of the trader, and then execution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, how does Ken start to develop his playbook? You know, you're working as a fundamental analyst. Yeah. You're seeing the, the prop traders. So I went through a very difficult time trading. You okay. know, I lost a lot of money um, because initially, like I told you, my, my fir the first point of, of, of trading was through fundamental news, just purely news, um, no technicals or anything. So eventually I, I got burnt on that front because okay. I didn't have any technical approach. I just entered that way. So when you would enter that way, you mean like a fundamental data release, mm -hmm. like would come out like CPI, mm -hmm. PPI, PMI, something like that would come out and you just make your decisions based on that. Exactly. And was this um, FX? Was it stocks or futures? So this was FX. This all, was FX. All, yeah, all FX. Okay. That's okay. where I found my, 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 my gap, uh, my okay. niche. So yeah, it's just enter on, on that basis. I would trade purely news on that day because for example, it was, is back then, obviously it's all changed now. It's easy as, you know, UK reported a much stronger growth figure GDP. Um, you would get in on the figure, the, it would spike, it pull back by 30 pips and then it'll go again to the upside and then it will remain high, you know, it will remain high through when New York comes in, it might have a little pullback, but it'll remain high. So you'd be able to hold that position and close it out when Europe and UK are done at like four, four, four thirty. That was it. That was easy. But as I said, eventually I got burnt out because I had no strategy. You know, mm. they, it was just purely trying to enter a, on a fundamental basis. Gotcha. You know, I didn't have key levels marked up on the chart. I didn't know where exactly to exit, you know. So oh, it, it all started to go wrong at some point. You know, it started to eat into my profits. And then, and then you know, what, what I didn't know that existed was trading psychology. So then I'd, I'd try and get, get, chase those losses, gamble, and it was just a whole mess. So then... Um, I managed to, there was a guy on that I used to feed information to because obviously we get information quite quickly. And, you know, so I used to feed some information to one of these traders um, called Ray on the trade floor, East End guy. He taught me how to trade. Um, he, tra he traded supply, he trades supply and demand. So um, with supply and demand, obviously a lot of people know, but it was for me, it's trading on the higher time frame. So looking for those key areas of, of resistance where those big sellers are going to come in to play institutional sellers potentially and um, finding demand areas, you know, where that buying is going to come into play. So just knowing those key zones. He taught me that. So then I implemented that trading. Um, I understood the fundamentals, tried to implement this the supply and demand. I found a little bit more um, structure and a, a bit more success, but I still wasn't making money because... Uh, again, the psychology front and because I didn't have a trading plan still. So I didn't know what a trading plan exists. It's all the thing is now, bro, it's it's very different because there's a lot more content creators. There's a lot of people providing value. Then there wasn't anyone like that. All I all I had was the news. Right. I just had the news and other traders on the trade floor that just had their way of trading, but no one really f providing solid education as there is today. So I had to go through a lot of, of failure in order to find, um, you know, what works for me after, you know, many years. I say it's four years, you know, to, to master trading, but it took me longer than four years. How long have you been trading now? I've been trading full time since 2016. But obviously, I started when I was 18 back in 2009. Um, so. And this is one of the reasons I respect what I know of you, because... Sometimes you have the younger generation, they come behind the those that like sort of paved the way and they look down on them because they have like a faster route to success. It's easier for them, but it's on the backs or the shoulders of those that came before, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm in like a younger generation of traders. I'm, I'm kind of late to the game, yeah. right? But I have all these content. I have all these books that are written, right? About psychology, uh, warnings from Mark Douglas, talks about trading plans and journaling software like Tradezilla, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you mentioned that, okay, you were sort of just traveling the route and trying to make the best of it. I have to respect it because you have to respect your level of persistence, mm. right? And I think that <laughs> persistence is missing just in the trader that kind of just has everything at, at, at his fingertips, right? Mm. So I like to continue along like how you, how you went, but I just want to say that like to the listening audience, like right now we want the mentor to just give us everything. Hey man, can you tell us when to buy? Can you tell us when to sell? We want the signals. But what you're showing is that it takes a level of uh, determination and persistence and grit and grind, right? 
uh, to be able to withstand the the ups and downs. And I think that's missing, um, you know, today. 100%. You're right. And I've seen a lot of guys that I respect today that are obviously a lot younger than me, like yourself, that are making good money. You know, they've had that faster route, as you say, um, on the back of people that struggled <laughs> like myself, because there is a lot more accessible. But when there's more out there as well, sometimes, you know, a couple of things can happen. One, people become lazy because they just want it. They just expect it like that. They see people making money and they just want it at the click of the fingers. But then two, on the front of people can get analysis paralysis because, you know, there is a lot of information out there and they'll get over consumed by this person's trading, that person's trading is so much. And, you know, you just need to refine it, take little bits from each educator or each content creator, but then refine it and make it your own. You know, don't don't get too, uh, you know, overwhelmed by all the information. Yeah. Know. Yeah, you have to personalize it. Yeah. So, okay, if we go to Ken's playbook, okay? Mm. You're building the playbook. So you learn supply and demand uh, from the trader. Mm -hmm. You have the fundamental background, right? How do you start to build your strategy? Like, um, is fundamentals like the first step and then technicals? Can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, so the first step for me was um, always number one was reading news flow. So what's happened in Asia? What, what are the markets talking about right now? What are institutions? Because... Um, still to this day, institutions write, well, they'll write daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports, yearly reports. I will read all of those. Um, you know, now, fortunately, and I'll give people a little insight. Today, obviously, we have chat GPT, right? And with a lot of these institutional reports, get them and just type in chat uh, GPT and say, summarize this in short, concise form or bullet point form uh, or easy to understand form. And it'll bullet point it all for you so you can understand what, what they're talking about. But I used to have to decipher all that information by myself and just get get a tone. What's everyone talking about? Are we talking about rate cuts to come from the European Central Bank or from the Bank of England? Understand the tone because I always say the fundamental tone is what is driving the asset that you're trading. Okay. It is, um, you know, the way central banks are positioning for that, for that asset, the way institutions are positioned as well. You just need to know what everyone's talking about. Okay. So just be on the right side as you would where there's a technical structure, you know, if we're printing lower highs and lower lows, you know, there's a trend there. There's also a theme. So you've got a fundamental theme, you've got technical trend and it's them having a alignment on those front. So I digest the news, um, understand um, what the market's talking about. And then I'd look to enter obviously technically um, with my supply and demand zones for me, Obviously, for example, um, let's just use, let's just think of an example here right now. Uh, say the dollar is trending to the downside, right? Um, the theme is, you know, the central bank has been talking about rate cuts to come. They're talking about monetary stimulus, pumping money into the market. So we have a fundamental theme that's to the downside. Now, I'll use my technicals and my supply and demand now to look at, okay, so when we get technical pullbacks within that fundamental theme, so the dollar now starts to rise and we've now entered a fresh uh, supply zone. Now I'm looking to, I'm monitoring the price action to see uh, signs of rejection because I know the fundamental theme is going to kick this back into play as well. We're going to have that technical rejection and it's going to respect um, the trend and, and uh, the theme and push to the downside. So then I'm looking at price action. For me, when we get into these supply zones, you know, I'm looking for reversal candlesticks like um, bullish or bearish engulfing, evening stars, morning stars. That sort of is as simple and clean as that. Um, and then I want to see a resumption of that trend. I'm a trend trader, so I like to be in trends. I like to see consolidation patterns where, and these pullbacks to then resume um, and, and getting on that trend uh, in what, whatever way it's moving. Okay, so on the pod, I have a lot of respect for different perspectives. Hmm. Um, and I've read a lot from a lot of the giants, right? So sometimes some of the arguments that people get into, I won't even touch it because I'm like, the giants have argued these things, right? Um, just like religion, like you, know, you have giants that have argued religion, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, I'm, I'm just a, a lay person. So I'm not even going to, I'm the common man, right? So I'm not going to get into the arguments, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you about the importance of fundamentals. And this is not to offend anybody, but I just want to hear like your, your honest perspective, right? So if you didn't have that first step of fundamental bias to see, okay, are we bullish, bearish, or neutral? on the US dollar, do you think that your technical entries, your technical strategy, that part will be less efficient? I'm gonna be controversial, I'm gonna say yes. Because um, I feel like if you're trading just purely technical, you're being tone deaf to what is happening with your baby. I, your asset class is your baby. And you, you need to know, you need to protect your baby. So if you're unaware of something that's gonna potentially harm your baby, that is irresponsible, okay? That's irresponsible yeah. to your baby because you know your baby is your, your, your way of earning. So um, there are times when, for example, I've seen before a bit of news happens 
And a technical trader is completely um, oblivious to, to, this, to this fundamental news that's happened. Obviously, it, but it's gone in their favor, but only fortunately thanks to this fundamental <laughs> news. And if that fundamental news didn't happen the way it did, then it would have caught them out. But uh, these are the things I think it's really important, you know, and I'm not, I don't want everyone, no one needs to become a chief economist, you know. Yeah, absolutely. They just need to have a base level knowledge of what's being spoken about and what's the talking points with the asset that you're trading. That's it, as simple as that. Fundamentals can be easy. How would you recommend someone start to understand the, maybe the biggest themes? Like what are the one or two or three big themes when it comes to fundamentals? Let's say you're, you're trading GU. Yeah. Is that, is that what you trade? What did you trade? GU used to be my baby. Yeah. So that's how I first started off, GP. I got to know my pair. And uh, if we just quickly, just, just on an another point, trading, if you focus initially on one pair, it's great. Because with me, what I got to establish was um, the way in which GU moved. At certain times of the day, you know, say, for example, it's just ahead of the London Open at, at 7 a.m. I know GBP is going to do X because I've seen it happen. It you know it happens time and time again. If you really study one pair, you'll understand the way it moves and you'll see certain patterns, price action, candlesticks, so on and so forth. So master one pair initially. Uh, in terms of what I trade now, I trade all majors. You know, I trade all majors because I'm understanding what's going on in all these economies. You know, I've, I've been able to expand my horizon on that front because I'm well-educated yeah. globally. Um, but then also I trade, I trade indices as well. Now, your question was, how would someone start? I'm going to firstly just use an indices example because you're an indices trader. I know there's a lot of indices traders as well. And then we'll, I'll touch upon um, GU. But with indices, as an example, right, if we're, there, it's a bit more of a trickier one to trade, actually, because there's more fundamentals. There's more yep. variables. Yep. Um, the starting point for me, obviously, say, for example, the Dow Jones, what I'll be looking at is the top weighted stocks, the stocks that are really going to be shifting the indice. Understand what's happening with those stocks, just as a broad basis. Look at their recent earnings report. You know, what's their revenues like, their EPS, their outlook for the business. Because how healthy these guys are as a business, how they're performing, is going to dictate the flow of the industry, the way it's moving. Then we've got the monetary policy side of things. If the FOMC, if the market's the way, are, the way they are now, bullying the FOMC to, um, you know, to want to cut rates, this is great for stocks. So in Lowering business costs, lowering inflation, uh, lowering um, interest, rate, interest rates. rates is great for businesses. So this is good for the industry. And then, of course, we've got the economy, right? If the economy is in great state, the United States, which it is, you know, people are still spending money, wages are high, the labor market is solid. Then what do you think people are going to be doing with disposable income? They're going to be buying these goods from these businesses, going to be using these services. And this is going to be great for the business. So we push, you know, Dow Jones or whatever industry up. So those are your three sort of main points that you'd be looking at. So, um, you know, earnings, health, financial health, um, central banks, and then the general economy performance. Yep. Same when it comes to currencies, a little bit easier because all I'm doing when it comes to currencies, I, I have a spreadsheet. And well, I don't really use it as much anymore, but I had a spreadsheet where I would put, say, for example, GBP here, the UK, and I'd have the United States. And then each data point that comes out, so say, for example, GDP, inflation, manufacturing, services, PMIs, I will input the figures here. Um, I would input what the central bank interest rates are at and what their tone is like, whether it's dovish, neutral, hawkish. And then I'm just comparing GBP versus the dollar, any obviously geopolitical news as well in there, and just comparing OK, just to, to have a fundamental bias over because with fundamentals as well, it's more it's more of a longer term play as well. Right. Yep. The, yep. The, the fundamental themes are a bit more long the term. Themes. That's what I didn't understand at first um, yeah. was that it was themes. I would look at the individual releases and I would see sort of a knee jerk reaction. And I just like, man, I, I can't understand this, you know. Mm. But now now I see that it's a theme. Right. So indices, you see massive bearish run. And then all of a sudden there's a there's a shift, as you mentioned, that, that talks about uh, rate hikes. All that stuff like that, just just to be short. Now we see this massive bullish push, right? But when it comes to the uh, the tone, mm -hmm. the argument about the tone is that it's subjective and it's hard to sort of understand if it's you know hawkish or dovish, mm -hmm. right, or neutral, mm -hmm. right? What would you say? Like, how can someone sort of? Is there a certain news source? Like, I pay for subscriptions from certain people mm -hmm. that I, I trust, mm -hmm. like the their analysis and mm -hmm. um, their bias, right? So I just pay for that that feed to come in, and they're constantly feeding me uh, information, right? Mm -hmm. How does a person maybe tap into something like that or start to be able to become more accurate in their ability to understand the tone? Mm, hawkish, dovish, or, or, or neutral, right? Definitely. Now, you you hit the nail on the head when you said it's subjective because there are times when I am forecasting a central bank decision to go a certain way. And then when it comes out, I still say, for example, I, I say this is going to be hawkish and I firmly still believe on the back of the decision it's hawkish. 
But the markets will interpret the way the markets want to interpret it. So you've always got to remember that. Swallow your ego, swallow your, your bias and see what happens. Digest um, the, the markets of how they perceive it to be and then run with that. How do you how do you get that? It's just just by reading, um, you know, obviously, as you said, try and find reliable sources there that are able to, to interpret that. Or, as I say, use the likes of Reuters, CNBC, Bloomberg and just see because they always write these little summary pieces after you'll see, say, for example, on the back of the FOMC decision, you'll get a nice summary piece in Asia where they said, OK, markets have perceived this to be dovish because of X, Y and Z. Um, and that's usually, you know, pulled by, you know, they'll take it on the back of because central banks like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan will put out research notes or little notes to their clients after a decision. They'd be like, the FMC said this. So and these are public. Yeah, these are all public. So they, they get initially get released to clients, but then clients then share them out anyway. And they're all over Twitter and everything. So it's just then just digest these little summary pieces in Asia. And then you're going to know the sentiment, the tone that's going to carry on. Now, one thing I... One thing about fundamentals I think that people are a little unfair is that they, it seems like the trader wants the fundamental analysis to be 100%, like to have 100% accuracy. They'll, they'll accept that the technical analysis can be 65, 60%, but they won't accept that the fundamental analysis can be 60, 65%. So do you agree that there's a, a degree of probability uh, that plays even with fundamental analysis. Like like you said, you may be hawkish because of what you've interpreted and others may also be hawkish, but anyone at any point in time can make a decision that serves them, serve their interests, and they can be large enough to to send price uh, in a different direction. Definitely. Do you do you agree with that? I oh, 100% agree. It's the same, you'll have the same level of probabilities fundamentally as you will technically. Now, as, as I said, it, it comes down to you swallowing ego, taking a sit back a moment, keep your emotions in check and just understand, um, you know, what the markets are, are looking to do with, with the dollar on the back of this decision. You know, I never, you never worry. I know people at a FOMO as well. You know, if we have initial decision, people want to get in straight away. No, just allow the markets to do its thing and then enter an, in a more calculated way. You know, oh, so. so I have a question about, so when you're trading two currencies like a GU, there's like a relative strength theory that you have to consider. How do you actually uh, compare the two economies, right? So I could, if I'm thinking about stocks, um, two companies, I can compare the, the relative, maybe by earnings, I can compare the strength of those two. Um, but how do you go about comparing like the UK economy and the, the US economy? As you mentioned, you have the spreadsheet. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Like I can see it in the, in the chart. Like when I look at <laughs> uh, the DXY, we're trending up. I can use that as like a, a technical indicator or an inverse correlation to GU, and I see GU trending down. But if you just talk about from a fundamental tone perspective, can you talk a little bit more about how do you compare the two to understand that one has, there's imbalance, uh -huh. there's divergence between mm -hmm, the two. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, number one has to be uh, monetary policy. So interest rates. Now, people have to remember as well, okay, using their analysis head, they have to remember interest rates are also the earnings for a foreign investor. So economies really thrive and need foreign investment. So if, for example, the UK is offering interest rate of 3% and the US is like 5.5%, where do you think a foreign investor is going to, where are they going to go with all this money, all this cash? They're going to go into the United States. So, you know, we have to follow money. We have to follow the flow of money. Who's paying the higher yields? Um, so we'll get all this big institutional investment going into the United States. That's the way I'm thinking. It's going to already sort of outweigh GBP. So that's the first point of what call, okay? Interest rates. Where are the yield? What's the yield for the economy? And then secondarily, I'm looking at, you know, the data points as well, just to make sure that obviously, yes, like now I'm going to throw in a little curveball here. Now, just because an economy is offering high interest rates, a higher return, it doesn't mean that's where the money's going to flow. Now, I'm going to tell you why. During financial crisis, and we saw it with the Eurozone banking crisis and a lot of the periphery, when I'm talking about periphery, I'm talking about the smaller nations like Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, they ran into a lot of debt problems, okay? They were struggling to get money in, foreign investment in, they ran into cash problems. So what happened, their yields on their bonds for these foreign investors spiked high. Now that's not a good thing. They spiked high, they're offering a high yield because it's a high risk investment. You know, they want to try and attract invest investors. They're offering like 20% yields, you know, on certain bonds just to try and get some money in. They're like, uh, but there's a chance it's going to fail for an investor. So 
You also need to understand, back to the point, you need to just make sure then, okay, yes, US is offering a higher yield. Let me just make sure the data and if the economy is in check in comparison to the UK. All right, so that being the case, so your recommendation, what I'm gathering is, okay, you first master one pair, right? So then you're looking at just mastering the fundamentals of US economy, UK economy, mm -hmm. like GU, right, mm -hmm. for example. And then once you do that, let's say you get comfortable with the U.S. economy, maybe you can start to trade more U.S. crosses, like the U.S., U.J., you know, and others, right? Definitely. Is that kind of like what you, you recommend? 100%. Your, <clears throat> the knowledge that you, you, you gain from studying that, say, for example, as we were just studying their GU, to then transfer into maybe U.J. is easily transferable. Um, the same things apply. You just need to, again, just understand what's happening in the Japanese economy mm -hmm. as an example, right? And it's it's very easy. And one of the big things, as I said, the number one thing comes down to monetary policy. Like when you look at UJ <clears throat> for so many months, obviously we're on a bit of a downtrend right now, but when you look at UJ for so many months, it was trending higher, higher. You know, we spiked above 150 and that's simply because there's a big monetary policy divergence between what the FMC are doing and the Bank of Japan. Bank of Japan historically have had low interest rates. You know, they don't pay any yield. So what people in Japan will do, what people in Asia will do, they will borrow this money. Because remember the interest is the interest that you pay back on the money that you're borrowing. So they'll borrow money for next to nothing in Japan. So then they'll take this yen and then they want to go and get a return now. They've borrowed this money for nothing. So they want to get a return on this money that they borrowed for nothing and go and invest it into higher yielding economies. So what they did, they sell their yen. We get yen weakness. The, the, the demand for yen drastically drops and the flow happens into dollar. So we see strengthening dollar. So that's why you get that, that rise in dollar yen because that huge divergence. Man. Yeah. <laughs> this is incredible, man. Because what I hear is when you understand the principles that move an economy, bullish or neutral, consolidation or bearish, when you understand it of one economy, you can transfer that knowledge, those principles over to another economy. So these same principles are applying across these different banks are economies, central banks, economies, right? Mm -hmm. And as you mature in this understanding, you grow to be like yourself. You started with GU, but now since you're, you understand the principles of all, of all these different economies, now you can trade these different crosses. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what I'm hearing correctly? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what, the thing is, is, is people might find Fundamentals are not sexy, you know, at first, you know, as you, you know, when you go to your, your, your desk, your charts, you're marking up your analysis, that's fun, that's sexy stuff, you know, fundamentals, you have to sit there and it has to, you have to try and pound it into your head. Like for someone like myself that hasn't been academic, I found it difficult. But once you then start to learn and, you know, you start to see, see what these people are writing about and you understand it. And then you see how things play out. It's so rewarding. And that in itself should keep you hungry and you know, okay, this is powerful stuff. And you should, you should get bit, you'll get bitten by the bug at some point and you'll want to keep reading more yeah. um, and diving into other major economies. So once you have that base level of knowledge and that encouragement that you see fundamentals are working, you'll continue to, you'll, you'll get through it. And look, it, there comes to a point now, for example, with me, it used to take me hours to sit there and decipher what's going on fundamentally. Now I'm doing it within like 30 minutes, 20 minutes, because I know where to look. And I just, when I'm just reading, I'm just skimming through, okay, that point, that point, that point. And it's just sticking into my head now. Before it wouldn't, but that takes time and you'll get there. It's just like the gym. You go to the gym, you're like, you don't feel like you're working out. And exactly. just to just to further the point, like in my group, we're trading indices, right? Mm -hmm. And from the technical perspective, you see this massive imbalance because it's just massively bullish. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, guys, don't look for sales. There are no fundamentals right now that will say we're going to break and go to the downside. Mm -hmm. Either we're going to consolidate here and, and start to range and hold. This support is going to hold mm -hmm. or we're going to create new highs. Mm. So that gave me the confidence. But at, in the past, I'd just be looking like, OK, here's a supply zone. And I'm trying to I'm trying to sell at every supply zone as we're going up. Yeah. And I'm just getting wiped out. Right. Mm. So I understand your point, because starting with that fundamental perspective, that bias is like the fundamentals you know, move the market, you know, that helped me out when it comes from a technical perspective, right? So I, I trade supply and demand, right? Yeah. So another controversial point, and when, I, when we say controversy, I mean, men of, of old used to be able to have debate, academic debate, um, logical debate, right? And it, it wasn't drama, mm. right? So we're just having like a conversation man to man, the people that are listening that have different perspectives, they'll have their perspectives, mm. right? Uh, but this is a platform of respect, right? So when people say that price moves the market mm. and not fundamentals, what would you say to that? My counter argument is, okay, what one example that I like to use is, look what happened with COVID, right? The COVID crisis. That was a, a, an event that was not 
um, foreseen. You know, it's one of those things that just happened that, that hit the markets. Now, did price or whatever sort of system, could that have predicted that what happened? No. You know, so this is why I feel like fundamentals has to be the starting point. The fundamentals is what places the value on that asset of that price is going to dictate where it's going. So, you know, again, in my opinion, I think that's number one. And then that price comes, you know, comes after. We need to determine the value first before you can put the price or send the price wherever you want it to go. Yeah. You know, and and that is how institutions are trading as well. They, they you know, at the end of the day, and, and you've got to, Going back to what I said before about money flow and investing in in stable economies, you know, the money isn't going to flow to, um, you know, an unstable economy. Um, so, yeah, fundamentals, number one. OK, number gotcha. One. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> I got you on record. <laughs> now, nah, man, I, I'm really enjoying this. One. I'm yeah, really enjoying yeah. this, man. OK, so now let's talk about uh, playbooks. Let's talk about playbook, right? So maybe your big picture is fundamentals. It helps you out. And then you, you look to, you know, start to trade with your technicals. Right. So I have this concept of in play, like maybe a certain currency pair is in play. Uh, and I've, I've adopted this from SMB Capital, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't come up with this. But the concept is they're looking for where the inefficiency is, where there's clear imbalance. And mm -hmm. I saw you call out, I think on Instagram, um, I saw maybe in your group, you called out like the uh, Euro JPY, maybe GB, uh, GBP JPY, just because you the announcement that came from the, the BOJ, maybe that was why. I don't know if it was if it was that or not. Mm -hmm. um, but do you kind of look at that concept of, okay, I'm going to trade what is in play where I can sort of calculate that there's a higher chance of imbalance? 100%. You know, I'm always looking for a clear imbalance. Um, you know, if, if, if I can't see any imbalance with, with currency pairs, I won't bother. You know, I won't bother. I find it's a little bit more risky and I, I have less success. So I need to see those clear imbalances and those clear fundamental shifts, you know, in where, where it's happened on the back of the event, that one that you just use as an example, that was because the Bank of J Japan were talking about potentially pivoting away from interest rates being for so low for so long. So um, they indicated that to the market. So I was like, okay, bam, that's an opportunity there. Um, so yeah, I, I need I need clear imbalances. Otherwise, I will stay away from certain pairs. So there's been numbers of times when I've seen, you know, GBP is similar to the US in terms of on an interest rate level and on an economy level. And I'm just like, you know what? Sorry, my baby, but I can't trade you right now. You know, <laughs> there isn't enough divergence or imbalance there. So I'll move to a different pair where there is one, you know, so um, yeah, man. So I have a question about, <clears throat> have you ever encountered a time when you don't understand how to digest fundamentally what you're reading? Like COVID, for example, mm. uh, these events that are sort of like outliers, Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about trading in these times or using fundamentals during these times? That, that, when I don't understand what's going yeah, on. Yeah, when you, like, COVID, like, I don't know if we've ever seen something like COVID in our, our generation, mm. right? No, exactly. Now, just on that point, well, during COVID, I actually had my biggest loss, you know, my biggest daily loss. I lost 23,000 pounds, and mm. it, still, it still sits with me today, you know. That was quite a big hit for me because, you know, um, I, I was just overconfident during that period. I was having a great run, a great year, great previous years. And I just, I had a little bit too much risk on the table, but then also it was having too much risk on the table, but then it was also, you know, liquidity providers had a breakdown. It, I was in a yen pair, I was in a couple of yen pairs. And yet we just had this massive flow of yen. I just wasn't getting filled with, with some of my orders, massive slippage, and it just wiped me like, you know, it's a big hit on that day. So yes, how do I how do I deal with that? At the end of the day, it's it's all learning experience, right? You know, with something like that, as you said, we have an experience in our life, but you then understand it. You you sometimes you have to just go with the flow, you know, go with this flow, understand what this new theme means for the markets, and just uh, you just learn. You learn on a job, really. You learn yeah. on a job. We're always learning, you know. At the end of the day, we don't stop learning. I still, as a fundamentalist to this day, obviously, as an example there with COVID, I learn, um, you know, what the market's going to do, and. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think trading is just constant on the job training. Yeah. I mean, you just, you're on the job, you're training, you're learning. If COVID comes back around, you'll be ready because mm -hmm. you, you've seen it before, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes though as well, at the end of the day, Mark, you know, we can't always predict what's going to happen in the markets. These unforeseen events happen. Don't beat yourself up about it. You know, you, you, you've, you've proven yourself, you've proven you can extract money from the markets just because this um, you know, this unexpected events happened and, and, and knocked you down. Um, don't let it keep you down. So definitely. then that comes the, the question about trading one pair. Do you think that people should stick to trading one or multiple pairs? Um, what's your general advice? Yeah. So, okay. So my general advice initially for a good, 
you know, year, at least a year is study that one pair, as I said, so you can spot and spot those patterns and, and understand the way it moves. And then obviously then you can hopefully start transferring your strategy and model to, to other, other pairs. Um, but at some, at some point you got to remember as well, when it comes to you expanding, so it can work either way, right? When, if you're focusing on one pair, in theory, there should be less trading, less activity going on because there'll be times when your pair is, is if you're a trend trader and it's in consolidation, not doing anything, you're not going to be taking any trades. Remember, we also have to remember that no trades is also a win. When we're out of the market, we get a mental reset as well. We can have a break. But then that means we're not, make, we're, we're not making any money. So if you were to expand your horizon, expand your knowledge into other, uh, other pairs, then there's going to be more opportunities for you when your pair is quiet and it may be quiet for some time. You know, it may be in a range for, for a long time. So at the end of the day, you need some bread, <laughs> you need money. <laughs> so go and look at potentially other pairs. But do note that, try and, and, and study that study that pair first. Make sure you understand the ins and outs fundamentally as well before just jumping in and hoping that your strategy will easily transfer because, you know, you need to understand. Like, for example, for me, you know, one pair that I still hate to this day that I can't trade very well is dollar CAD. Mm. You know, it just move, seems to move differently for everything, uh, everything else in my opinion. So, um, you know, just take that time a little bit before you start jumping into that other pair. But yes, uh, entertain it. So why do you think the dollar CAD moves a little di bit different? Like I think the CAD is a is a commodity currency as well. One hundred percent. We have to. Yeah, you 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 hit the nail on the head there, right? You're a fundamentalist now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I had to I had to show yeah, up, man. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So well, trading commodities is hard in itself because there's a lot of variables, and we have to. Yeah, as you said, CAD is a commodity linked currency. So we don't just have the Canadian economy uh, fundamentals deal with. We have oil. You know, um, CAD is correlated to oil. So when uh, oil's moving higher, typically speaking, that means more revenue, more income for Canada because they're a massive oil exporter as well. So um, we need to understand the fundamentals that are going on with the oil market because that's also impacting CAD. So, you know, maybe I'm not in a, um, glued in enough or, or locked in enough on the oil fundamentals. So that's why it doesn't sit quite well with me. I understand on a basis what's going on, but I'm not hawking it. So gotcha. yeah, that's why dollar CAD is probably a little bit more tricky for me because uh -huh. I'm not fully glued into the oil fundies. Yeah, and what yeah. what about gold? Do you follow fundamentals for gold? Yeah, for for gold, um, yeah, like for me, I'm looking on a obviously on a monetary policy level, on a geopolitical level, because we've seen you know what happened before with Russia and Ukraine. We see what happened, unfortunately, with um, Israel um, going into Gaza mm -hmm. um, and the flows of safe haven on that front. Now, gold fundamentally is impacted by supply and demand as well because we have to remember gold is a, is a precious commodity it's it's its value is based upon it being mined you know we have to mine gold and it takes a lot of resource to get that um and then gold is also used for a lot of goods today in 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 jewelry you know i think in certain mobile phones yep. so on and so forth um but then yeah understanding what's happened with the fomc what's happening with inflation now i want to give you let me just sort of break it down again. I want to give you a classic example of gold. So gold is no, what's known as a, a hedge against inflation. So when there's times of uh, very high inflation in an economy, now in if you look in the chart, people can pull up their chart in November of last year, of 2022, there was a massive gold rally and it clearly trended right to the upside, all the way up to those all-time highs in that sort of 2050, 2060 area. And the reason being was because high inflation. Now, when price- high inflation on the US dollar or- no, so high inflate. Well, yeah, in the US, also in the UK, in it was globally. You know what? That's interesting, man. Just to, yeah. I'll let you finish. Yeah, but yeah. sometimes I'll pull up, like if I'm trading gold, I'll pull up uh, the cross of the US, the cross of the euro, the cross of the pound, the cross of Australian dollar mm. to see if gold is bullish on all of them. Mm. Because I'm looking at, you know, the gold uh, value against the, you know, the dollar or the gold value against the euro. So if I see gold is bullish on all of them, then I know that there's something fundamentally around gold that's pushing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying, that's good. man, I didn't, I didn't understand this before, but if you, you may have inflation high across all of the different economies, mm -hmm. so everyone is hedging mm -hmm. and investing into gold, which is pushing it up. Exactly. Exactly. That's powerful, man. Exactly that. Powerful. Yeah. So yeah, that was going on. Yeah, man. Well said. That was going on in in 2022, and it was it was a really nice opportunity. That that was when I traded gold because it was trending firmly to the upside, and mm. and and then until we got we started to then get a period of the U.S. reported low inflation not long after, and then gold started to top out and sort of correct itself. So man, that yeah. is powerful, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, sometimes when we have those very aggressive moves. Sometimes, let's say bullish, like if gold is bullish, sometimes we have return to demand zones. 
other times we just have continuation, like maybe day after day. Do you have different entry models for those times when, let's say, okay, you return to demand zone, all right, I, I can form an entry, entry based on candles or lower time frame, um, breakup structures or whatever entry model I have. But if maybe we're just breaking levels day mm. after day, do mm. you have a model to enter you know, those types of uh, movements? Okay, so say for example, we're trending to the upside. Yeah, and I mean like, the, like there's a daily candle, yep. Marbuzu, then another daily candle, uh, <laughs> then another right, daily yeah. candle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not, there's no pullback. Even on the four hour maybe, there's mm. not even much of a pullback. Mm, 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 mm. I find sometimes those are harder to enter and I need some sort of like continuation entry model. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for me, for something that's worked really well during that period, if you look in November as well, yes, the daily candles were actually like that. Okay, so people can pull up their chart now and have a look. Now, you yet on the four hour, they're probably still quite bullish, but drop down to like one hour and 30 minutes and you'll see these nice periods of consolidation. And essentially, you know, we're forming nice little flags or pennants mm -hmm. subject to breaking out again to the upside. So I find bull flags work and pennants work really well in those periods. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, really nice. Yeah, this is, these yeah, are yeah, nuggets, definitely. man. Nuggets. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm generally like a higher time frame, mm. like a trader when it comes to finding my zones. Um, what about you? Like, can you talk to us about like your your technical strategy, technical model? Definitely. So for me, um, my zones are particularly on a daily, but I start off. I start off as as the cliche goes from top down. You know, so I'm starting off on my monthly. I need to see what the candlesticks doing there, the behavior. Have we just, for example, have we just formed a potential evening or morning star reversal candlestick to indicate we're going to see a, tr a trend change? Then I'm dropping down to the weekly just to understand the bias there. How are we trending right now on the weekly? I need I need things to align personally. So there's a lot of alignment that needs to go into play with my trade. I'm very risk averse. So I need to see the monthly, uh, the weekly then aligning with the monthly. And then now understanding trend there. Then on the daily, I want, I've got my zones marked up, my daily zones. Now, um, what I wanna see is, okay, we're, say for example, we are trending to the upside. I wanna see how we deal with a certain zone. If we're coming up now to a supply zone, uh, how are we dealing with that? Are we potentially seeing signs of reversal? Okay, because um, you know, are we gonna form a morning star? Are we gonna get a big bearish, uh, excuse me, an evening star? Are we gonna form a big bearish engulfing stick, uh, golfing candle in that zone? Or are we gonna get a nice little breakout retest? If for example, right, I'm, I'm fundamentally bullish of this asset and, and we're trending to the upside, I'm expecting, I'm waiting for that breakout of that zone. I want to see that breakout of that key area, that, that daily zone. I, I want to get a nice little breakout. And then I watch on the lower time frame. I look at the four hour, okay, to watch that retest. And then I enter on the hour. Usually how I enter on that breakout and retest, I'm looking again, just candlestick behavior. I want to see sometimes when we get a breakout and retest, we observe these little cluster of candlesticks of this, you know, just little consolidation candles. And then I know that we're getting ourselves comfortable, ready to break out and resume to the upside. Uh, so those are the sort of things I'm looking out for now. Don't get me wrong. There's times when, and you know, you just can't help it, but we'll get fake outs. So that zone will we'll, we'll push the upside. Um, we'll come back. It may start forming those sort of reversal candlesticks that I'm looking out for, for it to resume higher, but then we just fall straight through and I get stopped out. That's because mm -hmm. it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's a probability. <laughs> probability. Because exactly. people are making decisions that mm -hmm. we have no idea of why, uh, you know, these large institutions are making decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Man, I, I love that, man. Um, sort of similar to how, how I'm trading mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a question, though. What do you do when fundamentals and technicals are uh, adverse or uh, contrary, um, contrary to each other? Mm. I don't trade. <laughs> simple <laughs> as that, bro. As simple as that. You there know, you um, I, I will just uh, skip that pair and onto the next one. I, I need things to align. If I, if I'm trading, um, you know, purely technicals and the fundamentals are not aligning with those technicals, um, that's against my my playbook. That's against my 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 plan and my strategy. So I will I will just move on to the next. They have to align. So talk to me a little bit about now your risk management, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, are you risking like 1% per trade, 2% per trade? Like, um, are you prop trading or just all like- No, well, I've actually just started, capital. I've just started my prop journey now uh, okay. because um, I, for me, I trade my own, own capital and I have some private arrangements, but I'm looking to diversify. I'm looking to expand a lot more. So I've just started diving into prop firms. So we'll we'll report back on this, uh, I'm sure at some <laughs> point when um, I've got the seven figures locked in. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I'm heading on there, don't worry about that. So what type of trader are you? Are you a scalper, intraday, swing trader? I'm a swing trader. Okay. So I'm a swing trader. Now, um, I'm a swing trader, but I will set up two positions. So I will set up a position for where I'm looking for the price to just continue and trend, but then I also day trade. So 
Say for example, I'm trading GU and it's trending to the upside fundamentally for whatever reason. And I'm looking for this to just run higher, you know, a good 100, 200 pips. I'll have that, that first, first position. My second position will be, um, you know, day trading. So I'm looking for, um, you know, around 30, 40 pips. And what I'm looking for on that day trading session is I'm waiting for those periods of consolidation, you know, flags, pennants, so on and so forth. And I'm then, because I know the trend is to the upside, because I have that fundamental view that's gonna to continue to the north, I'm quite aggressive on that front. When I'm day trading, I'm anticipating a breakout. You know, some people wait, say for example, get these periods of consolidation, we break out retest. People wait for that retest. I'm getting in, I'm aggressive because all my views from top down, fundamentally all aligning, I'm getting in anticipation of breakout and resumption of that trend. So mm. I'll have a swing trade and I'll, I'll, and I'll day trade as well because, you know, just to psychologically pay myself along the way um, as well. Now, when I'm risking, I'm risking, every day I'm risking 1%. There are times when I'm risking 2%. I'm quite risk averse. The reason I will expand to 2% is when things are just, man, I've got multiple confluences. Typically on my 1%, I need three confluences, a fundamental, um, typically two technical. Um, when I'm going 2%, I need about five, you know, five to really be like, bam, yes, I'm going in, I'm risking more. Now, there are times when I go through losing streaks. Um, you know, I had one last week where I, I lost five trades. And when I, when I go through a losing streak, I drop down my, my risk, okay? So then I drop down to 0.75%, 0.5%. The reason being, one, is at the end of the day, it's capital preservation. I need to preserve my capital. I'm going through a bit of a, a downward period. And I know when I drop down to, even when I drop down to only risking 0.75%, I know things are gonna play out in, in the longer run. I have, my, when, when I'm trading, my risk to reward is always a minimum of, of three, you know, my, my risk one, my reward three. Um, so I know things are going to average out in time during these losing streaks. Right, right. Yeah. So let me ask you a question about mm. predicting the outcomes of these data releases, right? Because you said breakout. Mm. So when I think about when I first started trading fundamentals, I would normally wait until the data releases come out mm. and then I'd make a decision after. Are you doing that or are you actually beforehand looking at what the street is is uh, sort of calculating will be the, the, the case to come out? Mm. Are you trading with that sort of in mind already, that breakout? Now, so a, a lot of the times, most on most occasions, I'm trading uh, that way and anticipating that breakout on non-news days, okay? So when there's high impact events, like for example, today, US CPI, I, I'm not in anything, okay? I wanna wait, I don't wanna take that educated guess because I'm very sensitive now. I've taken a lot of wounds, uh, I've had a lot <laughs> of wounds from the market, been punished. So I, I, I just wait, I wait until the market, uh, wait for that initial reaction, wait for the market to settle down, and then that, that new theme come into play and that new trend. Um, now, there are times, don't get me wrong, where I've left, uh, where I leave the position open, and that is just me being absolutely, um, you know, bullish, not certain, because you yeah. can't ever be certain, absolutely bullish, but then I'm also already running in a decent profit. Risk management is, is has been account, accounted for, I've moved st stops to break even, it's a risk-free trade, only when it's risk-free, otherwise I just won't bother. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So uh, you wait for the release to come out and on, and then you you sort of like the market digests it, right? Mm -hmm. You digest it mm -hmm. and then you enter those times. Yeah. Or else if you're in the you're in the trade and you've already like maybe taken some partials or you're at break even, you'll just leave the trade let open. It run. Yeah, let exactly. It run. Okay. Exactly. I think that's a big question from people yeah. like, um, should I leave it open? Should I just take profits? Yeah. Um so do you do that based on like some past data analysis? Uh have you like analyzed your data and said, okay, on these particular days, if I would have closed, I would have came away with profit. But if I left it running, I would actually get more profit. Like, did you, is that a sort of data analysis or just sort of like intuition? Yeah, well, what, what I'd learned is just through when, when, if, when leaving positions open that high impact day, data, uh, during that high impact data, there are times when you just, regardless of your view, where I will just, even if I was long or short, I would have, would have been taken out on both directions because mm. markets are so, when, when that data comes out, there's so many variables that happen. You know, even with today's CPI, it may not be so clear cut as just the numbers are higher, for example, and the dollar strengthens. No, some people really break down the data, certain components that they look at. So there may be this volatility where the price spikes higher, it spikes lower, and then everyone's been taken out. So it's because I've observed that uh, and it's more sensible for me to allow the market to really digest and set the tone it wants to set. If you could just kind of summarize like to a, a new trader uh, or a seasoned trader that's technical, how would you go about learning fundamentals and starting to implement it? You know, mm -hmm. in your in your trading. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, the first thing that I'd say to do is um, 
read what's happening in these summary pieces. Because before, when I when I first started off, they were they were there's a lot of jargon. Uh, fortunately, today a lot of the information is being simplified. Okay, so anything that you read, like these little summary pieces, they're really written in Bloomberg and CNBC at the end of each session, the end of London session, New York session, Asia. Compile all these every day, okay? Just copy and paste them into a, a Google Doc and then read, okay? Anything that you don't understand, what you can do, fortunately, we have resources like AI out there today. You can just copy and paste them into, um, you know, for example, chat GPT, and then just ask, can you summarize this for me in very simple format? Just then you can understand what, what the theme is, what the markets are talking about. Anything you don't understand, again, as I say, put it into there or put it into Investopedia is a great tool as well. It really simplifies, for example, if you don't know what, um, you know, rate cuts mean for a currency or for indices, you can type that in. So my first starting point is just understand that base level of knowledge. Um, okay. Do some reading. What are the variables of the base base level? Can you just repeat like interest rates, inflation? Like yes. what would be the key points? So the key points you want to look at, first of all, at the end of the day, from, from the start of the podcast, we went over who the top guys are and it's the central banks. Just understand what the central bank's doing uh, for the asset that you're trading. You know, are they in a period of cutting rates, raising rates? Are they conducting quantitative easing? Just understand what they're doing um, and then understand what it actually means then for the, for, for the trend of the currency that you're trading. So that, and then of course, um, just go and start looking, start compiling the data, like I said. Yeah. If you're trading GU, just understand what's happening in the economy broadly. I'm not asking to really be an economist, just broadly speaking, and the same for the US. And, and then just start on, on that accord. Just simple, 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 simple. Don't overcomplicate right. it. Right. Sort of like um, when you are paper trading, when people say you need to mark up the charts, just get mark up, get your markups in so you can get your you can increase your pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Just start to gather the data from uh, the uh, the UK and the US economy, right? Mm -hmm. And then sort of build out these, you know, little pieces, little summaries and see if your bias is correct. Definitely. Maybe start off like that. Definitely. And and good thing is you, you don't always you don't have to necessarily uh, obviously it should be a daily practice, I think. But you can start off by just doing this in your weekly analysis. So on your Sunday, when markets are closed and calm and quiet, and you've got all that time. Um, a lot of people out there, if you just type in, for example, into Google News, type in Forex week ahead. A lot of there are a lot of blog sites today that will summarize. Okay, what's all the talking points this of the late last week and this week for GBP for dollar? You just get those summary points and then just understand, you know, just those talking points there. You gotcha. Know, so, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So then um, now I want to go into a little bit of psychology. Uh, if you're looking at I'm, I'm thinking about three traders when I ask these questions. Okay. The first trader is the struggling trader. He's seen no money. He's putting money in. He's not receiving nothing back. He, he's not receiving any love from the markets, right? What's your message to this struggling guy? Mm. Maybe he's trading two years. He hasn't seen anything. Three or four years, he hasn't seen any results, right? He has pressure from his wife. He has pressure from his family, right? So what's your message to this guy? Mm. Good question. Well, I'd first see just ask him to just check in with himself. Okay. So right now, are you struggling because, you know, mentally you're not quite there? You know, is there a lot going on in your life that you're, you know, you're really hoping that trading is going to, you know, provide a solid income for you right now? Um, are you, um, you know, is everything okay with yourself and, and what your surroundings, who, who, you know, who you're surrounding yourself with? If you, if, is your home environment stable? So firstly, check in with yourself and make sure everything's okay on that cord. If it is, and it's a case of um, that you're, you're inconsistent, you're losing money, you need to go back to the drawing board and check check your strategy. So um, is it actually working for you? Is it working uh, around your current life? You know, some people may be trying to, to scalp while they're at work. You know, you need to really get a system that works around your life um, and it has to align on that front. So um, those two things, first of all, and then look, Trading's not for everyone, okay? So um, I always say that to people, and I've said it to people that have come in my community, that's just had those difficult conversations and just said, at the end of the day, it might not just be for you. You know, you've lost yeah. X amount of money. You know, trading can cause some devastating things to people's lives. So it's just um, be real of yourself and be honest. Yeah. Yeah, man. Okay. So the second trader, this guy, he's making some money. Um, he's just above break even, right? How does this guy actually increase his edge or tweak his psychology or his risk management, right? To, to go into like making higher profits. My first thing actually is, um, is actually, is the guy working out. Mm. I find that working out really boosts um, your, your, men your mental well-being. Um, me every day, I have to work out in some form, not necessarily always lifting weights, but just getting out, walking, going for a jog. So are you active as a person? Because it's gonna make you more sharp and your clarity of mind's gonna be on point. 
Um, so that's the first point of all. The second point is, um, you know, really optimizing. Um, if you're just a, if you're just simply, simply a technical trader, I want you to expand. Please expand in, into into your fundamentals. Know what's going on with your baby, and I can guarantee you that's going to improve your edge without a shadow of a doubt. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love the advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the third person is trying to go from good to great. Mm, so like, greatness. Now I got technicals. I got fundamentals now. Right. Mm. I'm hitting tar. I'm positive most of the times, like uh, out of the year, most months out of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you've been inside of the institution. You've seen probably some of the greatest prop traders. How do I go from good to great? What are the characteristics that I need to to evolve now mm. at this point? To be honest, bro, there's there's no shortcut to it. At the end of the day, um, for me, you know, my years in this game have made me, you know, the successful and consistent trader that I am today. There's there's been no shortcut. So your consistent exposure, eventually you're going to evolve and you're going to see that turning point when you go from good to great because of your experience, because of the, the battle wounds that you've gone through. Um, you know, there are no shortcuts. Even the, the young guys that are coming in now that are fast track, at some point they're going to have a little setback, but that setback is how do they deal with that setback? Are they going to have that major comeback from that? So it's, it's going through those little ups and downs, but eventually you're ultimately nothing, absolutely nothing beats experience in this mm. market. Um, so that good to great will come with experience. Man, I love that, man. Mm. I think about athletes. I, I, I sort of consider us as mental athletes, right? So I always reference a Kobe Bryant or, or someone, right? Mm. And I remember he entered into the league and in one game, he shot like four air balls. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like that right there, when he talks about that time, I mean, now he's already like succeeded because he's made it to the NBA, right? Mm. He's playing with Shaq, you know, <laughs> with all these guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he said that that moment pushed him to another level mm -hmm. because he had to push through that those setbacks, right? Of airballing in front of everybody, his teammates are all mad at him, et cetera, right? So what you're saying is that, okay, at every level, even the guy that's already extracted maybe 200K, 300, 400, 500K from the market, he's going to reach a point where he's going to have a new challenge. There's always going to be new challenges to overcome in order for him to get to the next level. So it's, it's the tenacity, it's the it's the drive that'll help him push through, right? Exactly. All right. Now let me just quickly just elaborate on that as well. One thing is surrounding yourself with the right people. Now, um, prior <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, I I packed up my bags in the UK and I, went, I moved out to Dubai to live in Dubai because I hit an earning capacity. The circle that I was with there just wasn't doing it for me anymore. You know, sometimes you have to make tough decisions and cut certain people out of your your circle because you know, who you surround yourself with is going to, is going to dictate your direction, your drive. Um, so it, as much as you can expose yourself around the right people, get those trader, you know, those trader, uh, networks in, you know, there's other traders that are getting these payouts after payouts with prop firms or producing decent profits and surround yourself with those people because they're going to make you hungry, make you want to level up, um, as well. So I think that's really in key, your environment, your people that you're around. Yeah, when I went to Dubai, man, I was like, yeah. I went to a restaurant. I was like, Bugatti, 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 Ferrari. <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. makes me want to level up, man, being in Dubai. 100. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, any last advice you have uh, for some traders? I have a just a, a fun question that I do at the end. But okay. um, do you have any anything you want to tell the trading community about that you have going on or just any last advice you want to give the traders that are listening? Um, for advice, it's look, hear it from see me as a vet, <laughs> a vet of the industry. Um, and just look at the end of the day, I still make a lot of mistakes. Things happen. We're only human being, but it's how you deal when things are not going your way. Um, and you've made mistakes It's how you deal with that. You know, you have to check in with yourself and make decisions that are in your best interest, whether you need some time out to sit out, um, some time to reevaluate, um, and just never stop learning. For me, I'm always open to, to, to learning, um, because the markets are, ever evolving as i've seen we're constantly changing um new machines and technologies coming in so we have to stay ahead of time so always be on your toes don't take your foot off that gas um and just be willing to to consistently evolve all right man yeah. now just one last question um yeah. if we can fast forward 10 years from now yeah okay what would ken of 10 years from now tell the current ken yeah so current so ken from 10 years from now would tell current ken to uh, keep learning coding. So one thing that I've started to, to learn to do is code. Okay. So I've learned to write scripts through trading views, pine editor. Um, the reason being is because for me, I want ultimate time freedom. Now I have a decent amount of freedom and, and time in my hands, but I need more so that I can 
do more things with the people I love. It's cliche to say, but I have uh, children that I want to give more, devote more of my time to. So this Ken of the future is telling me to keep coding and try and automate as much as what you do as possible so that, you know, in the future we're there, we're set and, you know, time is fully in our control and we can do more of the things that we love with the ones that we love. Man, I love it, man. <laughs> I love it, man. That's a great perspective to have, right? Yeah. Like, send yourself out into the future and kind of look at where you want to be. Like that uh, Jeff Bezos has that, like, regret minimization framework. Like, when I'm 80 years old, what like what will I not have regretted doing, mm. right? Um, yeah, I love it, man. So, yeah, man, thank you so much, man. Yeah. This was very no, powerful, man. It, I really appreciate you driving <laughs> out here, man. Thanks uh, for being on the pod. Thank you very much.